<laughs> so, well, you, you have the floor with our... Okay, thank you very much. So, well, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here with you today and have the opportunity to share, share our experience here in Sao Paulo. Um, I prepared a presentation. I don't know if you have it there. Yeah. So if you could please uh, share the screen. I'm going to share the screen with you. Uh, so, well, um, I, I am Karina. I work uh, at the municipality of Sao Paulo mm -hmm. uh, as uh, the coordinator of the municipal early childhood policy. And thank you so much for this and good afternoon or good morning to everyone. <laughs> so, um, I will uh, share some uh, information about our our policy here in, in the city of Sao Paulo, early childhood policy. So uh, for, uh, to start, I would like to give you some background information yeah. about uh, the city of Sao Paulo and uh, our population. So uh, we are, as you may <laughs> know, a very large city. We have uh, 12,000 uh, inhabitants in Sao Paulo. And when we are speaking about uh, early childhood, uh, we have 1.1 uh, million uh, children aged 0 to 6 in the city of Sao Paulo. So this is uh, the map of our city. And you can see that uh, the red spotted uh, places are the district. So we have 96 districts in the city of Sao Paulo mm -hmm. and the red spotted are the ones with uh, the greatest concentration of, of children. So just for you to know uh, that we are, are speaking of an universe of uh, over 1 million children aged 0 to 6 in the city. Okay. And uh, another important information is that uh, from this uh, over 1 million children uh, aged 0 to 6, uh, a quarter of it, so 25% uh, of it, uh, benefit from cash transfer programs. So these are children uh, that are living in poor conditions and depend on cash transfer. Uh, their families depend on cash transfers. So uh, just to give you the legal context of our uh, early childhood policy, in Brazil, we have a, 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 a national legal milestone for early childhood. This is a, a law that was uh, published in 2016. It's a federal law uh, about early childhood. And from this law uh, derived uh, a municipal law that was uh, published in 2017 that set the, uh, the guidelines uh, for the early childhood uh, policy in the city of Sao Paulo. And in 2018, uh, there was uh, a municipal decree that established an intersectoral steering committee and a technical commission to lead uh, the development of the uh, municipal policy. And also uh, it gave the framework of uh, the elaboration of the municipal early childhood plan that was published in 2018. This plan, uh, it was um, developed uh, from uh, an, an initiative of the municipality, but with interaction of civil society, uh, of families, of uh, um, public workers. It was a, a, a great effort from a lot of different actors um, to publish this um, early childhood plan. It is a, a long-term plan that is aligned with the SDGs. So it uh, goes from 2018, 2030. And it is <clears throat> structured in uh, four different pillars. Uh, and each of these pillars has a set of goals and a set of strategies that uh, should be implemented until 2030. So the first pillar 
uh, is focused in, on ensuring the conditions for intersectoral articulation of programs, projects and actions uh, to establish integrated early childhood services. The second pillar uh, wants to ensure that all children aged zero to six have access to education, care and stimulus that contribute to their uh, development. The third pillar uh, <clears throat> aims to ensure protection and provide conditions for the exercise of rights and citizenship in early childhood. And the fourth and last pillar uh, aims to ensure the right to life, good health and nutrition to pregnant women and children in early childhood. So this plan is uh, the guide of the municipal policy. To implement this plan, uh, we had set up a governance structure uh, inside the, the city administration. So as I told before, there is a steering committee that is um, uh, in which participate six different uh, departments of the city. And um, after, uh, then we have a technical commission. So the steering committee is um, supposed to elaborate the strategy and make decisions about the policy. Then we have the technical commission, um, which is uh, formed from professionals, technical professionals from the departments that conform the steering committee. And it has the role to uh, make the intersectoral articulation technical propositions for the policy and monitoring of the policy. And then we have uh, the regional commissions. We have 32 regional commissions distributed in, in the city, uh, which are also uh, responsible to establish the articulation, the intersectoral articulation between the different departments mainly health, uh, education, and social protection. They're also uh, responsible uh, to help on the implementation of the policy on the, on the ground, on the territories, and to mon uh, support the monitoring of the policy. And then we have uh, another body, another actor here, that is a multi-sectoral evaluation commission that was set up last year. It is uh, composed of uh, members of the technical commission, but also a municipal early childhood plan. So the policy, uh, the early childhood policy has three main guidelines. The first one is the prioritization of social vulnerable children, pregnant women and families. So the focus of the policy are uh, vulnerable uh, families. The second guideline is the intersectoral articulation to guarantee access to public services and programs and to respond to situations of rights violation. And the third guideline uh, are services and programs integration to provide all necessary conditions for early childhood development in the city. So uh, now I will briefly uh, uh, tell you a, a little bit about how we are implementing these guidelines. So uh, on the prioritization of vulnerable families, uh, we made an exercise of uh, selecting the most uh, vulnerable districts of the city. This selection was based on uh, different indicators. So we selected uh, 10 different indicators and made a ranking of all the 96 districts of the city and selected the 10 uh, most vulnerable for uh, early childhood. So examples of um, these uh, indicators are uh, uh, child death rates, uh, pregnancy, adolescent pregnancy, uh, expect life expectation, well, very different uh, indicators. So we made this ranking. And now we are focusing uh, specific efforts on this 10 
10 districts. They are distributed like this in the city. You can see they are all uh, located at the borders of the city in peripheral areas. And uh, we are uh, making an effort to increase the service availability and the quality of these services in these uh, 10 areas. Uh, you may think, well, 10 uh, districts out of 96, that's not, uh, not a big thing. Uh, but these 10 districts, they concentrate 30%, uh, so one third, almost one third uh, of the uh, children aged zero to six that benefit from cash transfer service so uh, programs. So these districts, they are very representative for the vulnerable um, children living in the city. So uh, in the past two years, we are focusing on uh, delivering the services uh, in these 10 uh, districts. And we are talking about uh, preschool education, so we, uh, Sao Paulo has already a, a very high rate of uh, children uh, in preschool education, about 65% uh, of the children of the city are uh, enrolled in preschool education. But we still have a high demand for more uh, vacancies uh, in public preschool. So we are uh, making efforts to increase the number of vacancies in preschool education. We are making efforts to uh, increase food security and uh, nutrition quality uh, for children and pregnant women in these districts. Also the immunization coverage in these districts, we have still some, uh, uh, some areas which have a, a, a great gap of uh, vaccination. So we are trying to improve uh, also uh, these rates in, in these regions and uh, also making an effort to uh, improve and increase the home visiting programs. We have two home visiting programs in the city. Uh, one is from, from our health department so we have health agents that uh, visit the homes and then we have another um, visiting home visiting program that is from uh, social uh, from social security that is uh, called uh, um, criança feliz or happy child that's a national program and it is uh, focused on early childhood on so the visitors are, um, they visit the homes and um, make some activities with parents and with pregnant women with the aim of, um, of improving the parenting skills. And this is a, a new program in Brazil. It has, um, I think, two or three years that it is uh, being implemented. And it's, so it's, it's very new for, for us too. And we are still uh, expanding the program across the city. And then uh, the last service is uh, health monitoring, which is made in partially through the home visiting, but also uh, with our uh, health uh, care system. So we are focusing on, on these uh, five uh, services, uh, trying to improve and um, making it more available for uh, this population in, in these 10 districts. And here then are some steps towards uh, service and program integration that we are conducting. So we are strengthening the intersectoral governance structure that I showed you before, mm, trying to establish integrated service networks, uh, mainly with education, healthcare, and social protection. Uh, we are also developing a business intelligence solution uh, uh, this is a system, an online system that integrates data from education, healthcare, and social protection services. 
uh, in order to set up an uh, early childhood monitoring system. So this is still uh, ongoing, but we are, uh, are developing this integrated system so that uh, all three areas, so healthcare, education, social protection, are able uh, to see and monitor uh, in which services uh, these uh, children uh, are, are which services these children are accessing or which services these children are not accessing and we need to go after them so that they can access uh, the services, the programs or the benefits. Elena, and then just, we, just yes, I'm, to let you know I'm if you're wrapping up and okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and then um, the last thing is we are uh, elaborating an integrated early childhood protocol with standardized workflows, communication flow, flows and warning signals. Uh, this is also aimed uh, to guarantee that all children have access uh, to all services that the municipality offers and also that we can recognize any warning signal. So if uh, a child is, uh, for instance, uh, uh, being abused or suffering any kind of violence, uh, how we conduct these cases uh, in the network of uh, the services of the municipality. So this is the last <laughs> slide. Um, Apart from that, we are also um, promoting awareness raising campaigns and actions uh, that are directed at families and the society. Uh, yearly, we celebrate the Early Childhood Week and the Play Week. Uh, we had an extension of the paternity leave for the uh, public servants and the positive and responsible parenting course that uh, the, the future parents uh, have to make and uh, we are implement, implementing uh, a program that is called educational territories in the most vulnerable districts. Uh, these are interventions uh, in, in the urban uh, area, so around uh, early uh, childhood uh, daycare facilities. So I will not get into detail, just showing some pictures of this program. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry for uh, stepping over the time. Uh, I'll be available for your questions at the end. And thank you so much again for the opportunity to be here and share our experience. Thank you to, to you, Karina. I mean, I will wait for the questions later. If you participants can still post them on the chat area and then we can convey to the to the experts. And now I want to give the floor to Sofia, Sofia Garcia. She, I mean, it's introducing a friend. I mean, she's the head of a strategic partnerships, as I already told you, and external engagement at SOS Children Villages International. And she's going to talk about how uh, helping children to grow safely. But more than that, I can say that she's an inspiration for many other NGOs, how uh, work should be done at the UN. Uh, fighting with member states, engaging with other NGOs. He's, she's a key pillar for many NGOs and especially the NGO Committee on UNICEF that we both co-chair co together with IFFD. So uh, now I give the floor to Sofia. Hi everyone. Sorry, I was unmuting myself. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, apologizing for not being able to turn on my video. My internet connection is not really good. And I think we risk to risk to just connect and disconnect. So, so sorry that that I will not be able to do that. I will share my screen in a in a minute mm -hmm. to have something on on the background. Um, thank you very much, Alex and IFFD, for organizing uh, this this workshop. I think it's super super useful, hopefully for the participants, but also for the speakers to hear from from each other and and the wealth of knowledge that you can gather is is impressive. So thanks for the invitation and and for having me today. Um, I'm gonna maybe I you know I have around ten minutes. Alex, do not hesitate to turn off uh, or tell me if I'm exceeding the time, which I usually do. Uh, uh, so please, please let me know. But I thought maybe we do it in 
in, in, in two parts. I'm going to first share a little bit what SOS does in terms of advocacy so that people know where I'm coming from and where the learnings uh, I'm, I'm drawing from come from. And then a couple of, of tips of things that with the last years of experience advocating at the UN, uh, in New York specifically, uh, I have learned or we have learned an SOS that work or don't work in advocating for, for, for uh, family policies and for the rights of the child. So I will do those two parts. I will be quite general and really open for questions and comments and, you know, also happy to, to see if people disagree or has different experiences on what I've said. So, so really with the intention of fostering some, some dialogue. So very, very quickly, uh, what is, you know, maybe some of you have heard about SOS Children's Villages. It is an international NGO. Uh, we act as a federation and we work, and I'm gonna try to share my screen. Let me see if I can, uh, here we go, right? Uh, please let me know if you cannot see it, you should be able to, to see it now. Right, and I'm simply using the website, so it's quite uh, quite simple. I didn't prepare prepare a PowerPoint because I don't want to spend much time on this. But basically, we are in 135 countries around the world, and our mission, and I think uh, this is a good way to contextualize where we come from on the topics of family policy, is uh, to protect and defend the rights of children without parental care. Meaning, we work on the family from the perspective of how terrible it is for the child, from a child perspective, not to have one, right? So SOS started, uh, uh, you know, its work by protecting children that were temporarily or permanently separated from their parents, as you can imagine for many different reasons, from orphanhood, in least of the cases, but sometimes actual orphanhood, to uh, problems with alcoholism or violence in the household or neglect or whatever reason that leads uh, the authorities to determine this child cannot be in the family because it's dangerous for, for him or, or her and, and, and the, very, the very integrity and security of the child. So, so we come in that moment and try to, to create a family for them until we can reunite them back if we can to their family. So SOS really has this, this, uh, this experience and knowledge on, on, and we have learned over 30, 70 years of what a family really, really is, right? When you, when you don't have something, you really understand how important it was for you sometimes. So, so really with, with the child we understand. And of course we understand uh, the parents the direct or closest family uh, for a child is, is the, the, the people that bring him or her to school, that ensures they have health, but it's also the structure through which you build your personality, understand who you are and your identity. So it's really a very deep reflection of, of what are the things that a family brings to, to a child and, and how important it is as a structure to fulfill the rights of the child, right? So. We do, as I was saying, on the one hand, trying to create that family environment for the child that doesn't have one. But we also, and this is the vast majority of our work in terms of, of numbers, um, try to prevent family breakdown, right? So we do uh, have uh, family strengthening programs, we call it uh, this way, where we, through communities and the social workforce and schools, really collaborating with the community, which is maybe the first uh, thing to share. If you want to do advocacy on the family uh, nationally, regionally or internationally, you need to understand the community and you need to collaborate with the community uh, the family is embedded with. Context is, is really everything on the advocacy we do. And so through, through community work, we identify where are the problems that families face in the different, again, countries and regions and make a plan to make sure they don't break down. And sometimes it is simply finding a job or parenting skills or uh, uh, supporting single mothers or 
uh, many, many uh, different uh, reasons, right? Depending on the country and depending on the, on the very specific family, right? So I will not elaborate much on this because as you can see, it's in our website and there is a wealth of knowledge there on, on how, what things help families stay together and do their quote unquote job of protecting children, right? Uh, and, and, and also how do we work with communities and so on. So I will not get into, into this. The reason why I was saying all this is what I will talk about today is how do we bring this programmatic knowledge, this understanding of the very local level uh, um, uh, knowledge and experience to our advocacy, right? And how do we bring this into the UN. And maybe the first thing to say is, is that it's not easy, right? Um, connecting the dots between the very local and the very global is not easy because it's different languages, different priorities, different ministries, <laughs> different areas of attention and so on. But, but I would say maybe one of the first lessons learned is that the strongest advocacy the, the most impactful and the most sustainable, also the most difficult and the most complex, but definitely the most sustainable in terms of the, of the impact created and the, the one with most legitimacy is the advocacy which messes, messages are built on the ground experience. Right, there is a lot of NGOs, uh, and 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 uh, and sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't. You know, we tend to build messages on what families need and what kind of policies would work. You know, from a air-conditioned London office, and that's a very also UN thing to to do. Right, uh, uh, we have a lot of a lot of uh, experts and advocacy experts and policy experts that are really disconnected from the ground. So I think one of the of the you know things that that we should not forget in order to be impactful is to always consult and I would go as far as to say be guided by the families themselves, by the social workers that experience the hardship every day and by the children and parents and fathers and mothers and grandmothers, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that aspect of consultation, participation and routing advocacy messages on, 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 ground, on the ground experience is complex, but is, is really the impactful way to go and, and the way to make sure that the policies we finally manage to pass, whether in the General Assembly or in the National par Parliament, actually do the job, which is <laughs> right to make sure that, 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 that families are, are better off and are stronger, and thus societies are better off and are, are stronger. So maybe that, that, that connection to the community is very important. I think it is also important to make sure you know now i'm, I'm gonna go into into the into the un arena um it is very very important to one of the things that that we always try to do is to connect the different ministries that are going to put those policies together right advocates for the family tend to think okay my ministry is the ministry of the family or ministry of social affairs or uh, ministry of gender it depends on the country but but we often forget that you know for international law and for international advocacy the ministry of foreign affairs has a very big say and very often policies are not strong enough not because of lack of political will but simply because you know there is no connection within the government be between the Ministry of Education and the Government of Health, uh, sorry, Ministry of Health and, and Ministry of External Affairs, as I was saying. So I think, you know, to, to really put on top of the agenda uh, uh, family, the importance of, of, of policy on family strengthening, whatever uh, aspect it is, uh, we really need to, as a community, working on the topic uh, do a cross ministerial approach to it and and understand that you know families are such complex complex structure and have and, and run so many areas of life basically every area of the life of a child or the life of a of a person uh, uh, that we really need to connect connect those dots so that's something that that we have started doing and really really works for us um, I think it is also very important to, to contextualize 
and to uh, kind of tend the bridges between different topics, right? Uh, it, is, it is almost natural that the education community is gonna think of what education should be and should look like and we in, 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 in the support for family or child rights community tend to think what the child needs but in, in the case of, 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 of the family uh, at the topic of families it is very very important to connect the impact that this key social, social structure has on different areas. So we need to make the education community understand the importance of parents understanding the importance of education. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And the same for health and so on. And I think IFFD has done a fantastic job uh, using the, the very good channel of the SDGs in connecting those dots. Uh, I remember your publication on, on SDGs and the family where all those different development areas were connected and, and it was explored in depth, you know, how families can contribute or what's the key role that they play in achieving the different, the different, the different aspects. Um, and then maybe one more topic to put on the table and if it's interesting, happy to, to gather more or to elaborate more and, and gather some questions or comments about it is you know, the topic of, of family advocacy is a very political one. It's very political at the country level, at the local level, and definitely at the international level, right? And at the UN. Um, and it's a problem because we can do much less uh, impact than we could uh, because we have to go through a lot of uh, political challenges. Yeah, right? So maybe as a community, uh, 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 we should reflect more and do more work um, on, on making sure we are able to keep the conversation uh, uh, on the role uh, and the function that the family does for society and for children and for, and for its members, and not so much on, on the definition of it, because then we get into uh, very uh, difficult obstacles to, to to, we, we get stuck on a conceptual battle and not on a functional battle. Um, so, so really, it's a political topic, increasingly a political topic, but, but I think policy should be oriented into making the life of people better. Uh, and, and, and of course, respect a human rights and a child rights, rights approach. Um, acting together as a community and really having fora like the one today and so many others that IFFD and other colleagues create to, to really come together around what's practical and what's impactful, it's also very, very useful. Um, and maybe one last point a bit connected to this is um, on, on what can impact our work on, on advocacy around the family or honestly around any other, other topic the impact that, that civil society can do in the international arena is uh, uh, the, the increasingly shrinking space for civil society to be heard, right? Uh, um, instead of more consultation with not only organized NGOs, but also with, uh, as I was saying, the actual constituencies of families, young people, and parents, and children, it's decreasing. Uh, decisions are more and more being taken in a disconnected way and without broad consultation and reflecting the diversity of, of, of the civil society community. Uh, so I think even if it's not strictly connected to doing advocacy for, for, for family policies, for social protection, for child protection, it is important to always keep in the back of our minds as individual advocates, but also as organizations that, that we cannot take for granted uh, our role, our role as advocate and our space to advocate. And, and in our experience around the world, we see that even in, in pretty progressive countries back in the time, uh, the space to truly uh, be critical and contribute even with, with expertise is, is decreasing. And COVID has definitely contributed to decrease that space. There is uh, less consultation and less space for civil society to share their expertise and for families to, to share their views. So, so that's another, another topic to think through together as, as a community working on family policies. Alex, 
Thank you, Sophia. I mean, it's always inspiring to, li <laughs> yeah, to listen to you. And, and, and especially what you mentioned, that we have to keep on going and, and building things rather than just getting stuck in, in kind of political controversies. And I have some questions here uh, that I have been provided by many. So I'm going to share with you uh, privately, you and Karina, the, the questions. Uh, the first one is, is going to Karina. It, what duration was the paternity leave extended to? What was the case to support this extension? This question comes from Charles Albona from Nigeria. Karina, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, so uh, the uh, paternity leave uh, for, the uh, for the public servants in the city of Sao Paulo was uh, six days. Uh, standard for Brazil is five days uh, by law. We had uh, six days and now it is extended to 20 days. Okay. Uh, it wasn't very difficult to convince our mayor to make this change because he's very aware uh, of the benefits of an uh, extended uh, paternity leave. So uh, we made a, a project, a law project, and he sent it to the legislative and they voted for it. So it was approved uh, last year and we are very happy about it. Uh, 20 days, it's, uh, well, in my perspective, it's not enough, it could be more, but uh, it's an advance. So uh, for, for the Brazilian context, it's an advance. We are very happy about it. Uh, thank you, Karina. Now, I have a question here for Sofia. Do you have comments on the current situation of child recruitment by armed forces and armed groups over the globe? This comes from France, Remy. It's a topic where I am not the expert within SOS, so I will, I will not say much. I'm happy to share information afterwards on what SOS does on, on this topic. Um, but, but very generally, at the advocacy level, we don't work with the Security Council where these issues are, are addressed. Um, at the programmatic level, we work in countries in conflict, uh, from, from South Sudan to DRC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, as I said, it's, it's a very complex issue, but clearly the roots uh, of many, many of the, of the problems and the recruitment of children is, again, instability or impossibility for the families to, 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 to stay together, right? Um, so I will, I will send some information about what we do. What, we, what I know we do programmatically is uh, once uh, for, for the child soldiers that can, uh, that can get out of, of, the, of the armed groups and have lost their family, we try to find the family, we try to reintegrate as they have gone through, you know better than me, uh, very severe trauma. It's very often difficult to create that bond again and to create that trust again. So we try to work on that. And in the cases where it's not possible because the family is simply not there anymore, or it's just not possible to, to find them, we try to, to, to ensure they have foster families or they can live again in a family environment where, where they can recover part at least of their childhood and, and, be children, and be children again. So, but I'm happy to submit more specific information. At the advocacy level, we don't work with the Security Council. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I have, I have a, since we only have like three minutes left, I want to kind of post some kind of Last question for both of you. Uh, how do you manage the issues of children abuse at the children's homes and what practical measures are in place, especially in curbing efforts that establish these centers for personal interests uh, at the expense of children? I think we can start with Karina now. Okay, so that's a very, very difficult question. <laughs> Uh, it is uh, indeed uh, a challenge, uh, and we are facing uh, an in increase of cases of child abuse now with uh, the uh, coronavirus. And we made a, a specific campaign uh, now in, in the last months, uh, trying to 
made people aware of this uh, issue and we established a new uh, hotline uh, for for children and uh, well for the whole population to make uh, a denounce to to call in and um, to make these cases explicit uh, to the municipality and we are uh, as i mentioned before we are working on a protocol and uh, intersectoral a cross sectoral protocol uh, that should uh, manage these cases in a better way. So we have uh, sometimes these cases are identified in, in the school, sometimes they are identified in home visiting, sometimes uh, they are identified in, in a um, healthcare facility. And we are trying to establish these uh, workflows across these different uh, sectors so that we can respond better and, and take care of, of this uh, abused child in a, in a better way. So this is what we are uh, trying to do now, because it's very, uh, sometimes uh, the school identifies it, but uh, it doesn't go uh, to the healthcare system. So we're trying to establish these uh, protocols, integrated protocols, so that uh, these children are getting the attention they need. Okay. Uh, do you have anything to comment, Sophia? Thank you. Yeah, for building on that, reading the question, I understand, is not the violence that children experience in their home, in their biological family, so to say, but actually in, in alternative care uh, homes. For what I read in the email, otherwise, please uh, uh, let me know if it's if it's otherwise. It's a very very big issue. Uh, 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 violence in residential care, in in any in, in foster families, in any form of alternative care, uh, uh, there is a high risk for children to experience families uh, violence. And yes, it is true that. Uh, in many countries, there is little to no uh, uh, control of, of the kind of alternative care that is provided, and it can be openly in a pretty really willy way without no government control. What we try to do is to, to work at the systemic level on alternative care from an advocacy perspective, to really advise government uh, 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 and, and push governments to establish alternative care systems where there is mechanisms of control, not only to prevent violence when the kids are in any of the forms of alternative care, but that they are really in the type of care that they uh, that, that is best for the individual child, whether it is a foster family or is temporary care or is a home or or whatever it is, right? So, so there should be a governmental governmental control or local level and national level of what kind of, of alternative care is provided and, and there should be control. We we have uh, child safeguarding uh, policies and we do uh, a lot of work on that, increasing work on that and a, and a department working on it and try to share the knowledge and organize webinars with, with local, national and international uh, NGOs or care providers working on it to really bring up the, the child protection standards and make sure that that there is less and less instead of more and more uh, violence in in alternative care okay. uh, one last one last quick point is um, we also uh, in some countries are part of a campaign to prevent uh, what it's called voluntarism, which is often a reason for harm for the child. Mm. Uh, maybe not direct physical violence, but but emotional violence against the child, where you know uh, <laughs> herds of uh, young uh, European and American. Uh, graduate students trying to do good and with the best intention go 15 days to country X in quote unquote Africa and uh, and 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 take care of the kids for 15 days and they leave that that really brings a lot of emotional stress uh, for the mm -hmm. child and so we are trying as well to to make sure that that those things are, are not there but it's a complex issue and 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 an issue where a lot of work has, has to still be, be done, child protection and preventing violence in the biological family and in alternative care. Okay, well, thank you. I mean, it's been a great conversation with you both because 
Sophia brings up the, the global perspective and Karina has brought us also the local perspective and we actually have projects on both ends. And thank you for your, your inspiration also and your work done again locally and globally. Uh, we look forward to hear more from you in the future and we hope that this kind of workshops with young people, um, young professionals and even experts here participating is really